thank you very much. I'm Sylvester Johnson. I want to welcome you to this session of the Chicago Humanities Festival, which will be going on uh, for a while. So this is just the beginning of many great things to come. And today I'll be talking with you about a, a big question that has to do with machine learning, machine intelligence, and a big question about what it means to be human. So this talk is entitled Of Men and Machines. Obviously, those of you who seen this. I know this is a riff on John Steinbeck's of Mice and Men, uh, but of machines and men, uh, being human in the age of intelligent machines, trying to understand what it means to be human when we have spent so much time, many centuries, talking about human nature and human existence, particularly in terms of thinking and reasoning. And so uh, in that very kind and generous introduction that we just had, as you were told my research has dealt with religion and race and colonialism over several centuries, about the past 500 years in Atlantic geographies. And as part of that, I was, a few years ago, started doing a scholarly digital edition of an early English text. And this digital edition was requiring learning to use digital tools. And so here's a text that was written in the 1600s, and we get it rekeyed, we have this visual text, we started applying some tools to it. And I didn't realize that machines can actually read, this is an 1,100 page text plus, go through this text, recognize every part of speech, pick out certain words, and fully so-called adorn every bit of this. In other words, I didn't realize that a machine could literally read and understand grammar and syntax, grammatical structure. And what I quickly realized as I began to understand more and more about these tools what I quickly realized is that these machines were processing information. Um, I began to read up on this, and what I quickly found is that a lot of, many research into sciences are quite comfortable telling you very directly that machines can think, that they can be informational, and that we have only hit the tip of the iceberg. We're just on the cusp of what will quickly accelerate into far more amazing things. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot to you about uh, programming languages and the engineering and physics behind these amazing informational systems. I'll say a little bit about that. But what I will talk to you about and try to get you to think is what really fascinated me about this in the beginning. And that is, as I said, we have spent several centuries talking about being human in terms of thinking and reasoning. And that's actually thousands of years old tradition. That's, that's older than just centuries. But especially in the past few hundred years, the ability to think and to reason, to have empathy, to be interactive, to be intersubjective, has lay at the center of what we think we mean when we talk about the human experience. And I quickly realized that this is going to be a rather disruptive development. If we're engineering machines to think and reason, to be informational, then we're really engineering them to become better and better at something that we have claimed lies at the center of our own human experience, of being informational, of being able to engage in conversations, of being able to think about concepts, to draw conclusions, to reason about them. And that concept, that reality has uh, yeah, that reality has actually been quite central to uh, this project. So the first question that I will talk about, or issue I'll talk about, really is what it, how we understand personhood or being human in the age of machines. When a machine can think and reason in a situation like this. How do we understand the difference between being a person and being a machine? I'm not sure why this is not showing up. So sorry. We've got to get our machines to, uh, to cooperate with this. Maybe they didn't like what I was going to say. I don't know. <laughs> but how do we know the difference? If you think about it, if someone were to ask you, well, what does it mean to be a person? How do you know that a machine that can think is not actually a person? And I don't mean human in the sense that we, we think that rabbits are not humans, or we think that giraffes are not cows, or we think that cows are not human. That's not quite what, because that would be very easy. We just say, well, you know, it's not part of the species of Homo sapiens, it's not in the same genus, 
uh, is actually in a different phylum or kingdom. And so that's a very simple biological question. So I'm not asking that question. I mean something in the way that, I don't know if you've seen the, the bumper sticker, the dogs are people too, that, that there's a way of having a type of relationship with something that's not just a thing, that's not just an it, but that has a type of personhood to it. That's what we're talking about, by the way, when we talk about human experience. We're not talking about DNA. We're not comparing our biology, biological makeup to the biological makeup of a giraffe or to a eucalyptus plant. Well, we're talking about this sense to appreciate things. And so you'll see lots of examples of this uh, process that is the consequence of the attempt by humans to engineer machines to be informational, which means that, that humans are really making these machines uh, to be more human. They are humanizing these machines. And one of these recent films was Ex Machina. I mean, have you, how many of you have seen this film? It came out in the spring. All right. Uh, so it was, it was entertaining, and it's one of many that have come out, and there will be lots more. You should not be misled in thinking that just because this, this is a sci-fi film, by the way, that just because this is in science fiction, that it's all about fiction, and that this problem is not a real problem, or this question is not a real question. In this film, a intelligently engineered machine, pictured here in this ad uh, for the movie, it's based on the work of Alex Garland. He, he wrote the script for this. But uh, this machine is trying to convince a human that it is actually human. Not that it is a homo sapiens, but that it's actually a person. That it's not just an it. That it's not just a thing. But that it can appreciate what it means to feel, to think, to reason, to have emotions, to be concerned, to be worried, to be afraid for its own existence. It doesn't want to get terminated. And in this film, the engineer who creates this machine tells the guy who's going to test it that uh, if it doesn't pass the test, it'll be, it'll be turned off, it'll be turned to scrap metal. And he'll go on and build the next one, a new and improved one, see if that can pass the test. And so this machine knows what's going to happen to it, and she begins to beg the person who has it tested, please don't kill me. Please don't. Just let them understand my humanity. As I said, this is not just a, a bit of sci-fi. Uh, there is already a robust sense of debate about what machines can do. Can machines have consciousness? And what does it mean for them to be informational? Now, part of the reason why this question is so interesting and fascinating is for us is because we have a tradition of dualism, this division between things that are its and things that are people that has been part of many different societies, not just Western culture, but particularly Western culture. This is not a universal way of thinking about the world, but it has become a very compelling way of thinking about the world for a long time. And this dualism insists that uh, my phone is an it, that this floor is an it, that the chair you're sitting in is an it. We even have in our, in our English grammar rules about this. Uh, so if I say the bus that's at the stop, I wouldn't say the bus who's at the stop, but I will say the person who's at the door. We have who for people, and we have that for things. Right? And so even that logic is inscribed into the very structure of our rules of grammar in order to guide the way we experience the world, the way we encode it with our speech, the way we try to understand it. But as we begin to investigate this more and more, when we think about religious traditions, for example, some of which actually challenge this dualism, so one might think of Buddhist philosophy, or that really affirm this distinction, so one might think about uh, religions that emphasize the idea of a soul or a spirit that people have. We can think of uh, the, the emphasis of Rene Descartes, who in the 1600s uh, employed this very popular, widely quoted phrase, cogito ergo sum, that I think, therefore I am, that thinking is the basis for him, was the basis of trying to understand how you knew a person existed. And what he said, well, it's actually the activity of thought, of thinking, that allows us to understand that someone really exists. Because if thinking is going on, someone has to be there doing that thinking. You can't have thought without a thinker. But he also emphasized not just thought, he emphasized the idea that humans had something that was not material, that was not matter that gave them their personhood. Because otherwise, they would be an it, like a rock or a chair. And that personhood derived from this notion of a spirit or a soul. 
So he was blending these things together, and he tried to summarize and to elaborate on what it meant for humans not to be its, not to be things, but to actually be people. Now, even if we've not formally thought about that, we reflect a lot of those assumptions of dualism in our conversations, in our speech, in the way we think about the world. As I said, it's not universal, but it is being challenged. And one question one might ask is this. Well, we've never seen a soul or a spirit. We see bodies. We know that we are things. We know that we're made of stuff that came from stars. We are carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. So why don't we think that we're things? Why not? Or if we say, well, even though we can't see a soul or spirit, but it's there, then fine. But why can't other things have souls or spirits? Why can't intelligent machines have spirits? How do we know they don't have a soul or spirit? So that's not even necessarily a way out of this. In other words, we still have to deal with the problem of what it means for things to be informational, for things to be cognitive, and for things to be able to perhaps, perhaps not, but perhaps to have relationships, to be able to exchange not just information in the very bland and unsophisticated way, but actually to exchange something that moves beyond that to take us into the textures of what we might consider to be human experience. Another change there. Here's the note. In our own day and age, humans actually desire relationships with things. We want to have relationships with things, especially because we think this is not a person. So if any of you, most of you have probably used something like Siri or Google Now, or maybe you can speak directions into your car. And there's something about Siri. Apple knew when they purchased Siri and, made, and integrated into their products that people were going to be fascinated with this. Partly because we know that Siri is not a person or a human, and it's designed to be able to have a little bit of personalities. A Siri will make smart comments to you, for example. A fun thing is to ask Siri, what is the purpose of life? And Siri will, will give you a smart rebuttal, something like, well, you know, I'm very busy right now. I'll get back to you later on. But Siri's supposed to have personality. And so Siri is actually engineered by Apple to have humor, to have a bit of an attitude, uh, to make wise cracks. Uh, Siri can tell you a joke. And uh, Alexa is a creation of Amazon that's designed to do something serious, similar. With Google, their Google Now service is not really engineered to have personality so much as it's designed just to give you information. But people are fascinated with Siri. They like this because it's intriguing to have a conversation or an exchange with something that you know is not a human. You know it isn't a human. It's, it's kind of sort of a thing, but it can tell you jokes. And if you ask it a silly question, It'll give back a wisecrack. We actually like that. We're intrigued by it. And it becomes very interesting for us to, to try to understand even a bit about our own nature with these things. So meet Jibo. Jibo is the first commercially sold household robot that is being advertised and sold as a member of your household family. So Jibo is a company that was started by Cynthia Brazil a graduate of MIT, did a PhD there, started her own company. Her mission has been to bring humanity to machines. She wants to humanize machines, to give them, a, uh, to allow them to enter to, into our relational world, our world of uh, social formation, our world of empathy, our world of relationships. You can order Jibo right now today. Uh, actually, they're sold out. They, they started selling these uh, in advance last fall, about one year ago. And within uh, two or three months, they're going to open this up to anybody who wants one. But for about five or six hundred bucks, you can order this household robot. It'll tell stories to your kid. Jibo engages you in conversation. And it will, uh, will recognize you when you walk into the room. Jibo does not have any keyboard or buttons. You interact using natural speech. 
Jibo is just one of many products that are emerging in this way. Starting in about three weeks, about November 25th, so maybe a month from now, a little bit over a month from now, the Mattel Corporation will uh, begin shipping what they call Hello Barbie. And what they have realized is that machine intelligence can enable toys to come alive in new ways so that children can interact with them. The Mattel Corporation understands the long history of children having vivid imaginations with a bear or with a, an inanimate doll and being able to have a tea party, or maybe you've done this yourself, where you set out your little uh, military fighting pieces or it could be a tea set, and you have this experience with them. Well, Hello Barbie allows children to have conversations. And I don't mean simply, hello, Barbie. Hello, how are you? Fine. I mean, Barbie can interact with children in this way. Hey, it's great to see you. Let's say the kid's name is, is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. It's great to see you uh, today. I'm so glad you're here. What do, you be, what do you want to be when you grow up, Catherine? And Catherine might say, mm, I'd like to be a vet. And Barbie would say, well, I think it's really fascinating that when you grow up, you want to help sick animals. That's really terrific. This doll will ask your kid how their day was at school. And if your kid says, well, it was kind of bad because my friends bullied me, this Barbie will say, well, you know what? You really shouldn't let other people make you feel bad because of things that you like about yourself. That's a really unfair way of judging you. Think about that. Now, the example that I just gave you is about four different exchanges where person A says something, person B says something else. That's one exchange. A and B again, that's two exchanges. A and B again, that's three exchanges. Because of this toy talk technology that this Barbie is based on, Toy Talk technology allows from up to 80 to 200 levels of exchanges in a conversation. This Barbie works something like Siri in the way that it's linked with the cloud. So you press the little button that looks like a belt buckle on this Barbie's uh, belt, and that operates a microphone. The kid says what she or he is going to say. That gets relayed to this massive processing center in the cloud, and a, re a response is sent back to the Barbie, and Barbie speaks back to this kid. Is this real conversation? These lines are all pre-recorded. And this Barbie is really kind of like an avatar for a massive processing center that is really interacting or designed to interact with hundreds or thousands of kids at the same time. Is your kid really having a relationship with Barbie? No, well, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that, <laughs> see what we think. What is machine intelligence? How do machines actually process information? How is it that they can do what uh, researchers claim is actually thinking? Well, here are a couple of examples of machine intelligence. Uh, one on the left here is IBM's Watson Cognitive Computing Platform, as IBM describes that. On the other side is a, a chip uh, that is called True North. And I have this uh, text from the journal Science that published an article about this. I'll just read this because it's kind of small, that this chip contains 5.4 billion transistors that are wired together into an array of 1 million digital neurons, 1 million. Now, you have about 100 billion neurons in your brain right now. This has 1 million digital neurons in this single chip. Uh, and that creates about 256 million synapses. Just by comparison, your 100 billion cells are connected to about 1,000 other cells each. So you have about a trillion synapses. So the computing power of this chip is less than 1% of yours right now. Uh, but don't feel too smug because it's continuing to improve and become more sophisticated. But how do machines actually process information? Well, every intelligent machine is based on something called a transistor, which can turn on or off. And that's basically what it can do. It, it, can, it can basically generate what is called a zero or a one. And as you combine these, hundreds of them, thousands of them, think of turning on and off lights as you drive through the Chicago skyline and drive past it, rather, and you can see the different patterns in the building, and sometimes during holidays, the lights will be turned on and off to create something like a wreath or maybe a pumpkin or what have you. So that's what these transistors do. They create patterns. And because they can create patterns, they can actually encode 
information. The information is actually the on and the off signaling that happens across not just thousands, but millions of these transistors that together are forming the equivalent of a type of digital neuron. Just as your brain produces signals, intelligent machines run on electricity. Guess what your brain runs on? And not just your brain, but your whole body. Electricity, yeah. And it sends these signals across these neural networks in, in both the case of, of any intelligent machine, but Watson and True North. So that's, that's actually a very crass, uh, slammed down version of the, some of the physics and engineering of machine intelligence. That's actually the basis of this algorithmic activity and the information. If you have, a, most of you, if not all of you, probably use some form of a computer. Maybe you've written a paper, you made a, a picture, uh, you've taken a picture with your phone, or maybe even a camera. Some people actually have cameras now that are not phones. <laughs> but maybe you've taken a picture and you have it on your phone, but you're going to put it on Facebook. Okay, that's pretty common. Now let's just think about that. What happens? What happens is that on your phone, there is a pattern of these transistors that represent, and don't just represent the image, they actually encode the information for that image. And as you, you may say, upload it to Facebook, those servers at Facebook, they basically create the same pattern that's on your phone. They are, create the same arrangement. And we call that transporting information or uploading it or downloading it. It's creating another copy, but that's actual information and it's created through a pattern and that's how these machines are doing this thinking. That's how they're being informational. What can these machines do? I mean, why the excitement? Well, IBM Watson, some of you might, have, might recall that back in 2011, IBM's Watson won a round of Jeopardy. And this was a big deal. Um, questions were texted, were sent by text to IBM Watson. It was competing against humans. And uh, the great end of this for IBM is that in 2011, Watson actually won Jeopardy. Watson was the champion. And Watson is a, a massively parallelized data processing. Uh, they don't call it artificial intelligence. They call it cognitive computing. They say it's not artificial, that it's real intelligence, just as a plane, for example, is said to really fly, even though it doesn't do exactly what a bird does. But it wouldn't be fair to say, well, that's just pretend flying or fake flying. It's real flight. It still responds to some of the same challenges and, and physics that need to be, be done. But this Watson system of 2015 is far more sophisticated than what appeared on that Jeopardy show. Today, Watson is studying cancer oncology with one of the leading oncologists in the United States at the Sloan Medical Center in New York. Uh, Watson can interact using natural speech technology. You talk to Watson. You can actually, you, you can text Watson as well, but Watson can actually respond to spoken speech, just as the Barbie that I showed you and Jibo are responding to natural speech recognition. You interact by just talking with them. Watson is being used uh, to do medical diagnosis now. In fact, IBM launched what it called IBM Watson as an independent subsidiary of the IBM Corporation. And Within four months after they launched it, they launched it in January 2014. Within four months after they launched it, 75% of all dermatologists in the United States were using Watson to treat their patients in real time in their offices. Watson's rate, well, the human rate of medical diagnosis on average is about 38% correct on the low end and 45% on the high end. That's the average for humans. That's the average. Maybe you know a doctor who's much better than that. Maybe you know one who's much worse. If he's much worse, hopefully they're not practicing anymore. Watson's rate of accuracy is over 75%. It's close to 80%. Compare 75% to 48%. Now, let me ask you. If you had the option of deciding who was going to be responsible or part of your medical team for diagnosing your illness and for your health care, would you want Watson as part of your team? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, most people would say yes. Today, humans can wear these uh, Fitbits and other things that collect their health data, or if you just have a smartphone in your pocket, it's tracking where you go and whether, how many flights of stairs you climb. 
and eventually the, the vision is that these will accumulate even more intricate details, uh, not just pulse rate, but also eventually perhaps blood pressure, and send that to your doctor. Of course, your doctor, human doctor, cannot handle a steady stream of data. That's massive data, not even from one patient, not a steady stream of data. Maybe a checkup every three or four months. Watson can handle a steady stream of data. If Watson or something like it is part of receiving your health data as a data stream, from day to day, from week to week, your health can be monitored. If something looks like it's off, if you're having some abnormal changes in your blood pressure, if your heart beat gets too high, even though you're only walking a flight of stairs, or something else is happening, that informational machine can actually trigger an alert to a human doctor and say, this individual needs to come in for a checkup, and actually can contact you. This is Apple's vision for their new health division of Apple. And it's not just Apple. IBM is doing this. This is part of their vision for what Watson is going to be helping with. The massive data that is becoming available that we create now cannot be handled by humans alone. We will have to have machines to handle this data. And what informational machines promise to us is the ability to be able to extend our lives, to detect health problems before a human doctor might. I mean, think about how frequently you go to a doctor. What if something were constantly checking you just to make sure you were OK between your scheduled checkups? Would you want that? Well, most people would be interested in that. That's now becoming possible today because of these applications that are already happening. Watson is being trained to recognize abnormal MRI images to be able to diagnose instances of cancer or other disease. Watson can remember millions of images. No human doctor can do that. And Watson can compare any given image to that data set of millions of images in order to try to discern whether this is a normal MRI reading or an abnormal MRI reading. No human doctor can do that, at least not one who's not enhanced, but I'll talk about that in just a moment. So these machines are doing interesting things. And finally, uh, the reason why IBM is developing True North, IBM talks a lot about Watson, uh, not so much about True North. They talk about it, but not as much. This is much sexier because it's healthcare. IBM's uh, True North is actually being designed for the Pentagon, uh, specifically the DARPA program, in order to create a digital brain for the Pentagon's predators, uh, drones, for their, their military equipment. I'll come back to that in a moment. We also have cars. Self-driving cars now are keeping humans. That should be safer. There's an, an R there is just a shift on the format of this slide. This is the Mercedes-Benz F15. As you can see from, and this is a prototype, so this is not just a computer image. This car actually exists, but it's not in production yet. It's still being tested and developed. This is a, when I look at this, I think, wow, you know, I don't have a room in my house that looks that nice. A, certain, <laughs> a car certainly doesn't look that nice. But this is pretty snazzy. Uh, so these intelligent machines are actually quickly transforming even what it means to be in a car. So in this, in this prototype, obviously, people can sit together and face one another as they would in any room that was for entertaining and for conversation. The car handles the driving. There is a steering wheel, as you can see, behind the seat that's on your right, on the far end of your right. But for the most part, the car can do the driving. It is able to detect pedestrians as they're crossing the street. It'll stop for those pedestrians. It can avoid collisions. Uh, it, it can handle every type of task that it needs to in order to be able to operate the vehicle. And the humans, well, so on the doors, uh, there are computer screens on the doors. The windows of this car even double as computer monitors, so as touch tactile monitors. So think of the way you interact with the Windows 10 PC or with a, an iPad screen. You can manipulate it. You can draw different picture, pictures there. So if you're meeting with your clients, you can have a conversation with them, and you can discuss your PowerPoint and talk about that business deal on the way from the airport to the office, or even sit back and watch a movie. This could completely transform road trips. We, we do lots of road trips. And uh, when we do, I'm typically not able to watch the movie uh, because I'm driving, right? But this can change that. The drivers can actually go back and get some popcorn and experience something. But what's most significant about this technology is its capacity to make driving safer. 
If its ability, for example, to monitor a human who might be sleepy, who might not be paying attention to uh, what's happening in the, the field of view or driving and cars, this is already today what I'm describing right now is current technology, can monitor the human and say, you need to stop for a break. Uh, get a cup of coffee or something, you're falling asleep, or if you're about to collide with the car in front of you, the car today can, stop the, it can slow down the car or in some cases even stop the car. If you're about to change lanes and another car is in the adjacent lane and if you're about to collide with that car, with today's technology, and this is very apt, the, uh, in the introduction you heard this point about Tesla. Tesla just released an update that will actually ignore the human driver if the human is trying to change lanes and is going to hit another car. The car just ignores it. It won't let you change the lane. It actually makes a decision. It's engineer to say, look, human, I know you're trying to do A, but I don't think you should do that. So I'm not going to let you. And as a result, it prevents an accident. Someone's life might get saved. Or at least property damage doesn't happen. Uh, the same with the, the ability to self-park. So the question is this, one of the many questions, should machines be allowed to have full autonomy? Should we let cars override a human? If the human wants to make a turn that might endanger the life or the safety of the passengers, should we give machines the ability to say, I know a human is trying to do something, but I'm not going to let them do it? You're in my car now. I'm driving. I'm in control. We can see the advantages. They're pretty obvious. And I don't think it's fair to say that machines don't have agents. This is a big philosophical debate that's gone on for a long time. I think the R&D is way ahead of that philosophical debate because engineers are already designing things to do things. If you've ever been guided somewhere by your GPS, your GPS guided you there. It told you where to turn, and you listened, even if it was into a lake. And I hear these stories about people who, who drive into railroad tracks or oceans or what have you. They're just doing what the thing tells them. But I think it's fair to say that things have agency. They can do things. Should we allow machines to have autonomy? How will humans live in a world when machines can think for themselves? When they might, they might be able to override a human. Militarism is actually the place where artificial intelligence or machine intelligence has been most heavily researched and for much of the history of AI, where most of the research, especially in the, the early 2000s, was happening in the military. Intelligent machines today are integral to contemporary militarism. This is a product of Lockheed Martin, like other defense companies. Lockheed Martin is engineering intelligent machines for war. This is what's called a JAG-M, or a joint air, a joint air to ground missile. This missile is called joint because it can be deployed by the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force. It's not just from one unit of the US military. It has what's called fire and forget technology, meaning a fighter human operator can signal this missile to attack, let's, let's say, an enemy tank. It tells it which tank it is. It locks it on. And this is graphical. So the human is basically using something that's kind of like a joystick and locks onto the target. The missile is able to understand that what it's looking at is an object that can move. And it knows that the tank is not a tree. It knows a tree is not a rock. Okay. And the tank, once it's locked on, the human pilot can leave and go do something else. It's called fire and forget. Don't worry about it. The missile now can take over the rest of the job for itself. It'll follow the tank. If the tank tries to get away or evade, that's not a problem. Because the missile actually informationally processes that it's not just going to a point. It's not like firing a bullet from a gun, and it just goes straight. It's thinking, and it's looking at where the tank moves. And it can follow the tank and ensure a, a certain kill for its application. Well, how much thinking should these weapons have? One of the concerns that's raised is that if we engineer machines to kill 
And to be cognitive, they won't have to figure out how to kill us because we've already engineered them to do so. But there are compelling reasons to do this. Northrop Grumman, another defense contractor, is developing a technology that would allow humans inside of a, some type of military vehicle who are being fired upon by a rocket-propelled grenade. It will allow them to uh, be protected by an autonomous system that can detect that a projectile, such as a rocket-propelled grenade, is coming toward them from as close as 400 meters away or even farther away. But when it gets within 400 meters, it knows it's there. And that machine can hit that projectile with another projectile. That's just how fast it is. If, and it does that, and it can stop those humans from being killed or injured by the grenade that was coming toward them. Now, here's the question. If you insist that a human should be in that loop to decide whether or not that machine fires a projectile to hit another projectile, if you don't want the machine to decide for itself, will those humans have enough time to have their lives saved if they have to be involved in the process? No. There's no time for that. The machines are far faster than humans are when it comes to thinking. They're just better. So that's just an example of another argument for why machines should be given autonomy, and particularly in something as, uh, as delicate and as complicated as warfare. Uh, so these are very, very difficult questions that are emerging, and they're resulting from the fact that these machines are doing things that we have often uh, thought of as humans only being able to do. These technologies and capabilities are filtering down into domestic applications. Police departments in the United States are already using, not, not these, not missiles, they're using data analytics machines to try to anticipate which people are going to commit more crimes. And so people who've already been through a criminal justice system and who are out, who've done their time and living their lives, are being targeted by this informational system and identified as being very likely to commit future crimes. And even though they've not done any other crimes yet, today, right now as we speak, police departments in this country are already using this technology to go out and arrest those people for some very minor technical thing. If they were on parole and if they stayed out past their parole, they will try to get them sentenced to as many years as possible for a very minor violation. And the logic is, well, they're going to do something in the future anyhow. So if we can continue to lock them up for decades, then it's in the interest. But who knows the future? How can you say that this person was going to do something? So there are massive implications from this. Will humans and machines unite is the word that's being covered up. So, so far, I've been talking about humans versus machines as if here are the machines over here, here are the people over there. So here's a shot of uh, two models recently that were featured in, in People magazine. Uh, one, uh, the, this woman was born without a right hand, and this male model was, is a veteran from Iraq and was a victim of, of shrapnel. He had to have his right foot and lower leg amputated. So they have prosthetic devices. Prosthetic limbs are already very common in, in at least one level. It's already a fact that people and machines have already been combined for very compelling practical reasons, to be able to restore their mobility, to be able to ensure that they have independence. And so that's already very common. Even today, something called a neural implant that interfaces with the human brain is being used for patients who are dealing with epilepsy. And this neural device, there are thousands of these in use right now as we speak, sends a very minor electrical shock or signal to the brain when it detects abnormal electrical activity. That signals that an epileptic seizure is about to happen. So it sends a counteracting signal and corrects that. People already have neural implants. Now, that's very uh, crude technology. But what about the near future? Uh, so in the future, smart prosthetics, parts or prostheses, and brain implants will present the ability to enhance humans. This is uh, where I'll stop, and then we'll have Q&A about this. So just a few months ago, in September of this year, in 2015, uh, researchers at the University of California, Irvine, were able to allow a man who had been dealing with paraplegia 
for 18 years. He was able to walk again. He had a spinal cord injury. So because his spinal cord had been broken, the signals from his brain could not get to his legs. So they engineered a set of intelligent machine parts that could take the signals from his brain. So he was wearing a helmet uh, with a, these electrodes that picked up the signals from his brain that could tell when he was thinking about moving his legs. And that machine part sent that to another machine that sent that to another machine that is controlling the movement of his legs. And as he thought about walking, it would make the corresponding movement of his musculature. It sent an electrical signal to the muscles in his legs. So the signal path between his brain and his leg muscles was restored with machine parts. Now, this is today. Okay, this was a proof of concept study. And what they said is, now that we know this works, we need to continue to develop this with more people to see if others can do this. And if that works, then we can get this, shrink it down, not to a cap that you wear on your head with all of the gadgetry that you see here, but a brain implant. Uh, that will, can be, uh, send a signal to another implant that's in your muscles so that people will be able to walk again. And not just walk again, but to do all kinds of amazing things. In other words, what we're looking at is a very, very ethically compelling reason why humans should be combined and enhanced with intelligent machine parts in order to live healthy, full, independent lives. Who's going to say that people who are victims of traumatic injury, it could be brain injury, it could be spinal cord injury, it could be to a limb, should not be able to walk again, should not be able to have an independent life, should not be able to experience speech or have short-term memory again because we're scared to enhance people with machines? Who wants to make that claim? Who wants to deny someone the ability to do that? See, it's a very compelling reason. But then this goes back to my original question. I'm going to stop here. So I don't, I don't think that the way we've been used to conceiving of the human experience can remain relevant in the era of intelligent machines. I think that we will be forced, compelled, enticed, insert your, your verb, <laughs> to think about being human in synthesis with machines and their informational capacities. I think that we're going to be compelled to look beyond this binary of people versus things, to understand how things are already, in a way, what people are. We know that we process information through electricity in the way that these machines do. That's not an accident. There's a reason why it's happening in the same way. Who's to say how many parts you need to have, machine parts, before you can still be considered a human anymore, before you become too little human and too much machine. Who wants to draw that line? Who wants to say the real humans are over here because they have only a hearing aid? But these people over here who have the brainstem implants so they can walk again and have smart parts like hearts and kidneys, they're not really human because they have too many. Who wants to draw that line? I think that these machines, we have engineered them to be informational. And to the degree that we've done that, we've actually engineered them to do the things that we have claimed lie at the very center of our human experience. So I'll stop here and uh, want to thank all of these organizers of the Chicago Humanities Festival. I want to thank my, my wife, Heather Nicholson, who's here, and our daughter, Raina. Uh, Heather has been a very terrific intellectual partner in this and talking with me and never tiring of hearing me pontificate about these claims. Uh, thank you for attending. So I'll stop here and take your comments as well as questions. So thank you. I'll be coming around with a microphone. First question. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's very enlightening for me. Uh, I would like to make two comments. Uh, when you said the name of the first home ro robot is Jibo, mm -hmm. it, it reminds me, you know, I'm originally from India. And in my language, any living creature is called Jibo. So mm -hmm. it's what a coincidence. Oh. <laughs> so, yes. And another very personal thing, you know, my cousin, who is an engineer, who lost his two of, uh, like his eyes, you know, they had to take the eyes off in an accident. 
and he, but he did not lose hope in life. He's still working in different jobs, not, in a, not as an engineer, but he's, he's hoping to get a bionic eye sometime in his lifetime. So when I hear about you speaking, you know, so I was just texting him, you know, hey, I'm here. So this is so yeah, that's wonderful. Not yeah, some researchers, yes. uh, so uh, Mikio Kaku claims that yeah. he's one of these neurosurgeons and physicists who claims, not neuros neuroscientists and physicists, he claims that something like that yeah. is less than 10 years away. Great. Uh, now, you know, who knows? But yes, this, the R&D is certainly accelerating very quickly. The rate at which these changes are happening, that, that rate of change is always increasing. So things are getting faster at a faster rate all the time. And it makes it very difficult for us to judge uh, how far away things are. So there was a question back here. I find your question very interesting, whether uh, an intelligent, artificial intelligent thing can be considered a human. Mm -hmm. But what about the concept of values? Because we value safety and health. Mm -hmm. But what happens when the machine supersedes our values and decides, hmm, this person is not healthy and should die now? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, in an accident where there's two cars and the machine decides, we'll save one of the cars and not the other, and the other car has children, and the one that says survives has an octogenarian. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the values that machines, I don't think, can be programmed with? Yeah, so that's a terrific question. Can I just ask you for a follow-up? Why would machines not be able to, to feel or to have values? Is there, is there a particular reason why it should be impossible for that to be? Because this is something that, this is a big debate now. You know, it's one of those big questions. If, if you assume that information is one, that thinking is one thing and feeling is something else, and, that, and that's an assumption, and that they're not the same thing fundamentally as informational type of forms or experience. If we make that assumption, and if we, then how do you explain the way people even have feelings? And this goes back to Descartes. He thought, well, there has to be something that is not material that allows people to have these, you know, the experience to feel happiness or, or fear. There has to be some, that can't be things. That can't be stuff. Well, he, he didn't really know that. You know, he's claiming that. So it's, it's not, that's certainly a dominant way of thinking about this. And if there is indeed something that's not material, that's not physical, that allows people to have not just feelings but values, then one could say, well, this machine is material, so it can't do that. But we've never found what that is, not scientifically. What we have found is that when people experience laughter, what we see is that their brain cells are firing. That's a physical thing. Okay. And, and so this is a terrific question. And this, this is not a rebuttal or rejection of your question. It's a way of just trying to underscore its importance. Because the, the short answer to your question is that we actually don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. And some people like Stephen Hawking and, and Elon Musk, who is a founder of Tesla, have claimed that we should stop creating these intelligent machines until we figure out the question that you asked about, values. And, and some have said, well, what have humans done with their values? They committed genocide, they're destroying the planet, they have all of these, you name it, colonialism, racism, sexism, classism. Maybe if these machines don't have human values, maybe they'll create a better world. <laughs> I mean, some people have tried to turn the question around, but, but we don't know. And that's why it's urgent that we try to figure out some of this. Uh, there were some questions here as well, uh, here and here. Or comments as well. You don't have to ask a question. You can make a comment. I loved your presentation. Thanks. Um, a couple of things. First of all, the ethics then of distributing all of these wonderful things. The cost factor is enormous. And where does the society decide who gets what and how much of? And the other piece, in Elon, in Musk's car, uh, which is computer, and it's driving itself, it can be hacked. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what do we do about issues like that? Yes, right. Uh, that's, that, there are, I, so I did not mean to present you with the type of technotopian vision of the future, but rather to show you some of the challenges that are emerging. And this is a perfect example. Not only can cars be hacked, but as people get smart implants like uh, pacemakers, 
That can, you don't, the old ones you had to dial a phone and hold the phone up to the machine and it beeps and, and squirks and does these things and then on the other end they can kind of figure out what's happening. Now it just communicates to the cloud. But if it communicates to the cloud, guess what? Anyone in the cloud can communicate with your pacemaker. And it doesn't take much imagination to see how serious and, and, and difficult that could be. So one could hope that we're better, become better at preventing hacking. So far, it looks like we're creating more ways for people to hack. And this is a huge challenge. We have time for one more question. Okay. There's no question what the benefits these machines have for society. The question I have, if you create a machine that is superior to the human being in every aspect, mm -hmm. lasts longer, uh, literally, whatever, how do you stop them or how do you assure they don't say, I'm better than you, I'll create another one, mm -hmm. and that will eliminate you? That, that's a, a million or billion or trillion dollar question. So the question of, of human existence, the human existential question in that way, literally, will humans be extinguished by machines, is the most powerful question that is driving the debate around whether humans should be creating these intelligent machines. So I, I don't have an encouraging answer for you. Uh, <laughs> the the R and D I don't think is going to stop because a lot of so this began with military military research. I don't know the percentage right now. Back in 2010, 80 percent of the research and development in AI was being funded by the Pentagon within the United States. Uh, it probably isn't immensely far from that. Maybe it's around 50 percent. I don't know exactly now. But the point is that every nation wants to have Every militarized nation wants to have the first strong AI machine that has intelligence superior to humans so they can deploy it for military purposes. And no one wants to be second or third or fourth. And because no one wants to be second or third or fourth, you know, the U.S. doesn't want China to get it first. China doesn't want Iran to get it first. Iran doesn't want, name your country, Britain or Israel to get it first. Because no one wants to be second, third or fourth, there's only one way not to be second, third or fourth. It's to be first. And so we're probably, this is probably going to happen just because so much money is being thrown at it. So you could, you could say maybe these machines won't have those kind of values. You could say maybe people will, will introduce a stopgap measure, not a stopgap measure, some way of pulling the cord on the machines. Uh, but the machines, if they become the engineers, may figure out a way to prevent that from happening. At the end, I tried to introduce a, what's going to happen is not just humans versus machines, but there will be hybrid. Already people are enhanced with machines. I think for many, many reasons, that's going to accelerate beyond anything we've imagined before. And so I think in the future, it's not so much in the near future, it won't be people versus machines. You're going to have people who are, in, who are enhanced, and it'll be a wealth divide, so people who can afford private schools, can, they have more money, they can send their kids there. What if you can get your kid enhanced for $300,000 with neural implants, so they can download languages and have the kind of knowledge that uh, we see reflected in, in Google now or Siri or something like that, but only more sophisticated. They won't need to go to medical school. And the people who can't afford that access, what happens to them? Will, will, the, will, will this be people versus machines, or will it be enhanced humans who are exploiting and oppressing and basically creating a, a necrophilic world, deathly world, for the people who can't get access to that technology? We haven't figured it out. I don't know. But I don't think it will be strictly people versus machines. I think that we will have hybrids. And those, the people who are enhanced, that factor, I think, is going to drive the way this challenge plays out. So hang on to your seatbelts and hope for the best. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs>